Preface of the Red Battle Flyer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Weiss. The Red Battle Flyer by Captain Manfred Freyer von Richthofen. Translated by T. Ellis Barker. Preface. Some time ago a naval officer who was engaged on particularly hazardous duty was discussing calmly the chances that he and his like had of surviving the war, assuming that it continued for several more years, and that his particular branch of it increased its intensity. He wound up his remarks by saying, The chief reason why I particularly want to survive the finish is that I'm so keen on comparing notes with our opposite members in the German Navy. That is the answer to those who ask, as an important official gentleman asked recently, why this English translation of Rittmeister von Richthofen's book should be published. It gives our flying people an opportunity of comparing notes with one of Germany's star-turn fighting pilots, just as that excellent book by contact gives the Germans the chance of gathering the atmosphere of the Royal Flying Corps as it was in 1916 and 1917. The Red Battle Flyer has evidently been carefully censored by the German authorities. Also, it has possibly been touched up here and there for propagandist purposes. Consequently, although the narrative as it stands is extraordinarily interesting, the book as a whole is still more interesting on account of what one reads between the lines, and of what one can deduce from the general outlook of the writer. There is perhaps little to learn of immediate topical interest, but there is much that explains things which were rather difficult to understand in the past, and the understanding of such points gives one a line of reasoning which should be useful to our active service aviators in the future. When one makes due allowance for the propagandist nature of the book, which gives one the general impression of the writing of a gentleman prepared for publication by a hack journalist, one forms a distinctly favorable mental picture of the young Rittmeister Baron von Richthofen. Our old friend Froissart is credited with the statement that in his age of chivalry it was always impossible to inculcate into the German knights the true spirit of knightliness, which seems to indicate that the practical German mind of those days could not understand the whimsicalities of the Latin ideas of chivalry, which, for example, made a knight against whose shield an opponent break his spear, haul off out of the fight to the lanceless enemy, unsheathed his sword, and drave into combat again. Probably the Hun of those days proceeded to stick his opponent in the midriff, wherever it may be, and so finish the fight. In the same true spirit of knightliness, an Englishman knocks a man down and then stands back so that he can get up and have another chance, whereas a more practical person would take excellent care that his opponent never got up till he had acknowledged himself beaten. It is all a matter of the point of view, and largely, no doubt, a matter of education. However, making due allowance for the point of view, one finds surprisingly little hunnishness in von Richthofen's manners or methods as set forth in print. It is one of the accepted facts of war that the German aviators have displayed greater chivalry than any other branch of the German services. It was a common occurrence for their pilots to fly over our lines in the course of their business, and, by way of variety from that business, to drop packets containing letters from captured British aviators or the personal belongings of the dead. One gathers that these acts of courtesy have become less frequent of late owing to the intensification of aerial warfare, but it seems that captured or killed aviators still receive the full courtesies of war from the German aviators, whatever may be the fate of prisoners in other hands afterwards. It is not surprising, therefore, to find that, taking him all round, Rittmeister von Richthofen conveys to one the general impression that mutatus mutandus, he is very like an English public schoolboy of good family. His egotism, as one finds it in the book, is the egotism of a young man who is frankly pleased with himself, but is more elated by his good luck than by his cleverness. Taking him by and large, one rather likes von Richthofen, and one fancies that most of the RFC people who have fought him would be quite pleased after the war to sit at table with him 
and compare notes over the cigarettes and liquors as my naval friend wants to do with his pre-war friends of the German Navy. And there are unhappily not too many of our present enemies of whom one would like to express such an opinion. When one comes to read into the book, one begins to find many interesting things about the German army and the war in general, as well as about the German Feldfliegertruppen, or flying service. The German is not really a skillful censor. Just as certain portraits painted by an artist at Ruhleben conveyed by the expression of the faces a good deal that Germany would like hidden, so von Richthofen's book, though carefully censored, lets out quite a good deal of information. The first thing that strikes one is that Germany's standing army at the beginning of the war was nothing like so perfect a fighting machine as we in this country believed. Although, like all people with any sense in this country, the German army knew that a war was coming, the officers and men seemed to have set about their work in a singularly amateurish way, judging by the short section of the book devoted to the opening of the war on the Russian front. And one is pleased to find that von Richthofen has the grace to laugh at himself and his brother officers for their mistakes. In some ways the soldiers of all nations resemble one another strongly. For instance, one finds in this book the same contempt for what the Germans picturesquely called a base hog, as the French have for the embusque, and as the British front-line officer has for the young and able-bodied officer who is something on the staff. This obnoxious breed is the same in all armies, and must be clearly distinguished from the carefully trained and expensively educated general staff officer who is very much of a specialist and is the very brain of the army. When we come to the purely aviatic portion of the book, one finds more of the real von Richthofen and less of the cavalry officer. His honesty about his utter metal confusion the first time he went into the air recalls General Brackner's famous remark in his lecture to the Aeronautical Society when he said that no one ever sees anything at all during his first hour in the air, owing to the hopeless confusion in his mind caused by the novel aspect of everything. Von Richthofen's description of his experience is about the best thing that has been written on the subject. An interesting bit of information is disclosed in his description of his flight in a Grossflugzeug on September 1, 1915. At that period little was known about twin-engined aeroplanes. The Germans were known to have tried them, but they were not a success. The only example known to our people though probably there was actually several different machines, was commonly known in the RFC as Zwang Wang on account of the curious noise made by the engine or air screws when they got out of phase, as an electrician might call it. This noise is now quite familiar to the inhabitants of southeastern England as the characteristic note of the Gotha bombers. Von Richthofen's good judgment of fighting values, though he was then only an observer and a novice at that, is shown by his disapproval of the twin-engine aeroplane as a fighting machine. It is also of interest to learn that, at that period, the Germans had tried an auto-lock device to hold the rudder of a twin-engine machine over to one side so that it would fly straight if one engine went out of action, an ingenious idea, even if foredoomed to failure. It is encouraging to find that, though these twin-engine machines were in operation in September 1915, the first bombing squadron so composed only came into action against defenseless Bucharest a year later. This shows that actually we in this country are not so very much slower in producing our new ideas, for our big Hanley Page twin-engine biplanes first flew towards the end of 1915, and we began to use them regularly early in 1917, only a little more than a year later. The similarity of aviators in all countries is shown by von Richthofen's frank confession of blue funk when he made his first flight alone. That first solo is always the most anxious time in a pilot's career. Another touch of that nature which makes all aviators akin is seen in his accounts of how he and other pupils under instruction used to fly off on cross-country training trips and suffer from opportune forced landings in the parks of their friends or in likely-looking estates. One imagined that this manifestation of wongling 
was an essentially English trick and would not have been tolerated for a moment under the iron discipline of the German army. In the early days of the RFC, this looking for opulent host used to be known sarcastically as hunting for Jew palaces. The state of affairs on the Russian front is well shown in the brief reference in the book. Flying in the East is absolutely a holiday, says the writer, who adds that there was no danger on the Russian front except the danger of being massacred by the Russians if brought down by engine failure, from which one understands that the Russians did not approve of making prisoners of enemy aviators. Their archies were apparently good, but too few to be useful, and their aviators practically did not exist, which is rather what one ventured to surmise in print at the time, despite the magniloquent Russian communiques. When one thinks of all the good British and French aeroplanes and engines which were sent to Russia, one regrets the waste of material. On the subject of air fighting, von Richthofen is always worth studying carefully. None will dispute his wisdom in laying stress on the importance of calmness in an air fight. We have lost many good fighting pilots through their getting excited and dashing headlong into an unequal combat. He or his editor has been sufficiently skillful not to give away his pet method of attack. However, one gathers that he depended largely on his first rush for his results rather than on a prolonged series of maneuvers. His dictum that in-air fighting results depend on ability and not on trickery rather bears out this impression. Nevertheless, he occasionally tells of a lengthy tussle with a particularly skillful enemy. Such a story relates how that very gallant gentleman, Major Leno Hawker, one of the best loved and admired of the RFC's many gallant fighting leaders, fell. It would seem that Major Hawker's machine was outclassed rather than that he was beaten by superior skill. One is glad to find that von Richthofen pays a tribute to the bravery and ability of his enemy, and it is perhaps some slight consolation to those of us who knew Leno Hawker to think that he fell a victim to the German's best man, and not to a chance shot from an unworthy foe. It is rather curious that some time after emphasizing the fact that trickery does not pay in air fighting, von Richthofen should show how trickery does pay by describing his young brother Lothar's trick of pretending to be shot and letting his machine fall apparently out of control so as to break off a fight with opponents who were above his weight one is inclined to wonder how many optimistic young air fighters have reported enemy machines as driven down out of control, when in reality the wily Hun has only been getting out of the way of harm. The older hands in these days are not easily caught by such a trick, and the high command refuses to count any victim so claimed unless the performance is verified by independent witnesses either on the ground or aloft. Another point of interest in von Richthofen's fighting methods is that he states that, as a rule, he opens fire at fifty yards. Distances are hard to judge in the air. The pilot is more likely to underestimate them than otherwise, just as one does in judging distances at sea. But von Richthofen is probably as good as judge as any, and in this he seems to be stating a plain fact. In these days, fifty yards is fairly long range. Some of our own crack fighters prefer fifty feet, if they can get into their favorite positions. Anyhow, he shows the unwisdom of opening fire at one thousand yards, as some inexperienced and excited machine gunners are rather apt to do. Von Richthofen's chaser squadron, or Jagdstaffel as the Germans call these formations, was the first to be known as a circus. The famous Boki squadron, although a fairly mobile body, the members of which cooperated closely on occasion, never developed formation fighting to the extent that von Richthofen did. His men, although, as the book shows, they went out periodically on lone-hand adventures, generally flew in a body numbering anywhere from half a dozen to fifteen or so. Their leader chose to paint his little albatross a brilliant pillar-box red. The others painted their machines according to their fancy. Some had yellow noses, blue bodies, and green wings. Some were pale blue underneath and black on top. Some were painted in streaks, some with spots. In fact, they rang the changes on the whole of the paint box. They flew wonderfully, being all picked men, 
and in a fight they performed in a manner which would have seemed impossible to the most expert aerial acrobats. Also the squadron was moved from place to place as a self-contained unit, so that it appeared wherever the fighting was thickest, or wherever British or French reconnaissance machines were busiest. It would be operating at Verdun one week, the next week it would be north of Arras, a few days later it would be down on the Somme, but as a rule it specialized on the British front. Wherever it pitched its tents it did its regular squadron performance and followed it later in the day with lone hand raids or strafing flight by two or three machines at a time. When one considers the Harlequin coloring of the machines, their acrobatic flying, and their two shows a day performances from their one week pitches, it follows logically that the hubris of the RFC simply had to call the squadron von Richthofen's traveling circus. Since then, the word has acquired a meaning of its own among flying men. It connotes practically any special formation organized for the purpose of hunting enemy aviators and consisting of picked men under a specially skillful leader. It need not necessarily be more mobile than any other squadron, and it need not indulge in freak colorings, though in the nature of its work its flying must be acrobatic. The British circuses are in these days superior to the German circuses, because our machines are now at least as good as those of the Germans, and so our men, who have always been of higher average quality than the German aviators, have a fair chance of proving their worth. Of those of von Richthofen's circus mentioned in the book, Schaefer was the first to be killed. Before the war he lived in London to learn English, working in an office in the city when so inclined, but mostly spending his time on the river or in sport. Those who knew him say that he was a pleasant lad and a good sportsman. Vost was the next to go, after what has been described by those who were in it, as one of the most gallant fights of the war. On a Fokker triplane with a French Lerone engine, evidently an experimental machine built for quick maneuvering, he fought single-handed a patrol of six of our people when he could have broken off the fight and have got away by abandoning an inferior companion. He was a brave man and a most brilliant pilot. His flying and shooting in his last fight are said to have been marvelously clever. None admire his bravery more than those who fought him. Others of the circus have fallen since then, and the present Richtrov and Jagdstaffel is probably constituted very differently from that band of high-spirited desperados which was evolved from the original bulky squadron and helped to build up the fame of von Richthofen. There is none of the old RFC who would not cheerfully kill what is left of the circus, and there is probably none who would not gladly shake hands with the survivors after peace is declared. They are worthy enemies and brave men. This little book gives one a useful insight into the enemy's methods, and more than a little respect for, at any rate, some of those whom we are at present endeavoring to kill. C. G. Gray. End of preface. Recording by Tom Weiss. Tom's Audiobooks.com.